This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 623, recorded on May, no, recorded on June 2nd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. Good to be back. I'm looking forward to this. It's uh, 83 degrees and cloudy. Uh, let's just roll. Also joining me from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's also 83 degrees, which is 29 Celsius, but here it is sunny. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Sadly, it is not 83 degrees here. Um, it is 72 instead, uh, which is 22 Celsius and also cloudy. I don't know what it is here, but it's not 80. That's for sure. I think it's closer to Brienne. I'm in New York today at Columbia. And we have a guest today. I think now this will be his second time. On third time. Third time. Third time's a charm. Uh, he is the president of the Eco Health Alliance, Peter Dashak. Welcome back. Pleasure to be back, Vincent. Nice to meet you all. Um, first time was a global viral project discussion at the Northeast Infectious Disease Lab up in oh, Boston. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And then last time was in Singapore, December like 9th. Yeah. And uh, we talked about other things. We had no idea that SARS-CoV-2 was circulating at the time. It's weird, isn't it? It is very weird to to think back to that because we'd just been in a session. Zheng Li Shi from Wuhan Institute of Virology was talking in a session. Everything was positive and we're looking forward to the future and doing more work and mm. preventing pandemics and little realizing one was actually beginning. Amazing. Yeah. And so I had recorded the session with you and... I thought, well, I got back and then the uh, the outbreak began. So I said, I should really do another one with you to put it next to it because it seems weird that we're not mentioning anything and then we couldn't schedule. And so I released it anyway. And uh, But people seem to like it because you've been in the news for <laughs> some time now. And so now I'm glad we can get together. And I, I, I do want to talk about um, SARS-CoV-2 and your surveillance and and bats and so forth, because um, which which we didn't talk about too much last time, and so um, let's see, Kathy, you wanted to find SARS R, right? Sure. Uh, my understanding of it is it just means SARS related, but maybe throughout the show we'll just say SARS R to make that clear that we're not talking about SARS CoV one or SARS CoV two, but yeah. SARS related SARS R. So that's a nomenclature, Peter, that you've uh, the field has decided. Yeah, it used to be SARS-like uh, yeah. coronaviruses, but it changed to SARS-R. SARS-R, SARS-related. Okay. So I looked – I know you've been uh, – EcoHealth Alliance has been doing bat surveillance for a long time. So I looked to see the first uh, surveillance paper from China for SARS-like coronaviruses, and I found this one, 2005, which not too long after the SARS outbreak. Bats are natural reservoirs of, of SARS-like coronaviruses. And uh, Zhang Li is on it, and Lin Fa, um, and you. Uh, so that must be the first results of some surveillance that you started, right? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it feels like a long, long time ago. And actually, another another group on it, um, uh, Hume Field, who was yeah, the yeah. co-lead of the WHO, SARS veterinary investigation to wet markets. And it was kind of his idea that bats might carry SARS-related coronaviruses. Mm. But that was pure serendipity because we, we actually did that work in China at the time. We were looking for NEPA. We, you know, we were asked by a couple of Chinese scientists, Zheng Li Shi um, mm. from the virology side, and Xi Jiang, uh, from, who's a bat biologist, very well-known bat biologist, they, they thought it'd be interesting to see if some of the bats in southern China had Nipah-like viruses. Yeah. And we didn't find them. We kind of failed, but we did find SARS. So you're already there for the Nipah project then, right? Well, just that. We, we, got, we got 
an, an email saying, would you come out? And actually, yeah. um, Hume Field and I sat down and chatted and thought, well, the chances of finding it are really low. Do we really want to do a whole full-on investigation? So we sent our kind of, um, you know, uh, team leads out. I sent John Epstein out there mm-hmm. and Hume sent um, his chief technician out there, uh, Craig Smith, who's now works for, for biosecurity in Australia. And, you know, we, we kind of joke about it. They failed to get NEPA, so it was a, the mission was a failure. But what they did <laughs> find was two years later we got um, – uh, Lin Fa Wang had developed a bunch of serology tests that worked on on those bat samples, and he showed that there were antibodies mm-hmm. to SARS-related coronaviruses. Then we found sequence. So, so at this time, we're talking that the publication of this paper is October 2005. Uh, at this time, the uh, SARS-1 epidemic was done. Is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, in everyone's mind, it's done. You know, this is the problem with emerging diseases. Once it go, once they go out of the human population, we kind of think they've gone. But what's really happened is they've gone back to where they came from, which right. in this case was, was wildlife, yeah. But at this point, it wasn't at all clear what the origin was. At least bats weren't had not been identified. Yeah, if, right? you, if you look back to the original papers on animal, the animal side of SARS from Guan Yi and others, they were really looking at, civets as the reservoir that was their hypothesis originally that these were the reservoir house and they'd found them in the market and that explains it guan, guan yi then had a team go out to civet farms where people were trying to breed civets for the food trade because they were so expensive and they found nothing um, and when we looked at those data and when hume field from the who team looked at those data we all said well why would so many of these animals that Guan Yu collected in the markets be positive, PCR positive for a virus if they're the natural reservoir. If I go in, into uh, New York State and sample birds in summer for West Nile, I'm going to get one in a thousand PCR positive for West Nile. They got something like eight out of 10 positive. So it, it looked to us like they'd been infected in the markets mm. and they weren't the real reservoir. So you mentioned that you did this to look for NEPA in bats. Um, at this point, did you have any thoughts about bats being particularly unique reservoirs or why did you decide to look um, for viruses in bats at all? Well, we, we started um, with NEPA. I mean, it, you know, I, I was working at CDC for briefly as a guest researcher, they called us back then, because um, I was still, still a U, UK citizen back then. Um, and it was during the NEPA outbreak. I was volunteering in the labs. And, um, you know, we realized it came from bats. I found it very interesting. I'd written a paper in Science, a review paper, saying, talking about the links between wildlife and humans. So, and I said in that that it, it's clear that bats are an important host. And it might be interesting to go out and find out what other viruses bats carry and how diverse NEPA viruses are, for instance, or. Ebola viruses, there were already hypotheses out about bats as the reservoir for Ebola. Um, Hume Field had done the work in the wet markets. He'd found bats in those wet markets in Guangdong during SARS and tested them. And there were some unusual results. They seemed to react against an antibody test for SARS, and so did some other species. So that was where that inkling of an idea that bats might carry SARS. But at the time, we didn't really think bats were going to be so... um, significant as reservoirs and i think that's when we first started making the connections that bats really are something interesting for mm. viruses in general so did you did you go on this particular sampling trip yourself no i didn't i, I didn't think it was going to be um <laughs> worth, worth the effort i'm, I'm saying that to you and uh, i know this will be publicized but it's true i mean you know and and you make these decisions all the time. You know, yeah, you, sure. you've got limited budget, limited time. And, um, but what a, what an amazing result. And I do remember the call from Linfa. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at first we heard back, they were negative for NEPA. So we said, well, there you go. That was not worth the time and money and effort. But then about a year later, Linfa had been doing some extra testing with Chung Lee using his new um, assays. And he called me and said, look, we've got something you need to sit down and, and get ready for this. We think we found SARS. Mm. What? <laughs> and um, your first re- reaction is, well, that can't be true. You know, come on, that's too too 
too good a result. And, um, you know, after a lot more testing, we eventually got, I think we got a whole genome sequence out of one of them and really good, obvious serology. I mean, what you want from a wildlife host is, um, is to be low PCR prevalence. That's natural for, for an infection that lasts a week or two. Most, you know, it should be one in a hundred animals are, are positive for the virus or PCR. And then 10, 20, 30% should be zero positive, meaning that the virus circulates in that population naturally. A third of the animals should be infected in their lifetime. That's normal. And that's what we were seeing with bats, rhinolophus bats in particular, horseshoe bats. And so the infection is limited in bats. It doesn't go on their entire lifetime. We don't, yeah, it's limited. It's, they get it. They clear virus. Um, it's a GI tract infection. What we don't know is if they get reinfected. It's you know, there's a lot of talk about bats in the lab, but bats are not easy to work with. And I, there are very few groups that have lab colonies of bats to do work on. Um, and usually they're not the rhinolophus bats that carry SARS-related uh, uh, coronaviruses because mm. they're really hard to keep in captivity. So. No one's done that work yet as to whether they get reinfected. How does the uh, sampling work? Um, can you give us a sense for that? Well, you, you go out to, you know, a, let's say you go to southern China where we've done a lot of work. You go to limestone areas usually. The limestone has all these caves running through them because it, acid rain sort of drips through. And, um, you know, you, sat, you go in during the day and you check out the cave and, mm. you know, even during the day, you've, you, you don't go in a cave nowadays without wearing full PP or at least very good uh, mask, goggles, gloves. Um, and you scope out and you see whether there is a good colony of bats in there. And the great thing about bats is their behavior is very predictable. They're going to fly out um, as, as dusk comes. So you can set your nets up outside the cave entrance and catch them on the way out. And then you can sample them during the night and release them. And if you want to, you can go pre-dawn and catch them on the way in. So that's how we do it. But it's, you know, it, it can be quite hard work because you're doing it, you, you kind of got to do your sampling at night. So you're tired during the day um, and you're dealing with animals that are quite delicate. The small insectivorous bats are very delicate and you've got to catch each one individually. So a bat lands on a net, you have to take it out quickly and carefully and put it in a bag like a, a little cloth bag, hang it up. It has to relax there, and then you get a few ready, and then the other team starts doing the sampling. Um, they, they're notoriously difficult to work with because they're so um, delicate. They're small animals with a high heart rate that are used to flitting around through the air quickly. They don't like to be handled. Mm. And, and when you sample them, are you taking rectal swabs typically? Oh, yeah, we take um, – we try and do a good job of it. You know, we take um, – Saliva, uh, swabs, uh, rectal, um, urine if we can, a uh, blood sample. And we take a, a wing punch, a tiny biopsy from the wing. The membrane in the wing heals back, so it's not damaging the bat too much. Um, and we, d we check the DNA of the bat. We do a barcoding to make sure we know what species it mm. is because they're not easy to identify in some countries either. And you said, so you found nothing for NEPA. How many bats would you have to look at before you would conclude that? Yeah, true. I mean, you, the, you, you've got to do your power uh, calculation on that. But after, after you sampled, um, what, what you would expect for a, a NEPA reservoir, if we go out to um, Teropus, the giant fruit bats that do carry NEPA in Malaysia and uh, carry Hendra in Australia, if you sample a couple of hundred, you will find a handful of positives, you know, a 1% to 5% prevalence so after doing a few hundred bats um, with the proper power calculation you can pretty much say that you, you can rule out that this um, you know and plus we only sampled a few anyway mm. it was a few the trip was a few days i remember mm. and so basically with these samples saliva fecal etc you're just doing pcr right to see if you can yeah. amplify something Consensus PCR, easy to do, easy to do in countries where uh, there's low um, lab capacity. Uh, you know, some countries where they, you know, uh, you're in remote areas, you're working with a lab in a remote area, for instance, or in a, in a small clinic. Um, so, and, and what we try and do now, I mean, we've refined this a lot over the years. And what we do now is we've got 
really good cold chain from remote sampling sites back to the really good labs. And that's what we try and do now. We get the samples onto uh, liquid nitrogen quickly and get them back into the lab as quick mm. as possible and do all the tests in there. So in this particular paper, uh, you had on the order of 30% of one species of bat uh, that were seropositive. How, how do you pronounce the that species? It'll be rhinolophus. Yeah, rhinolophus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know how to think about that. On the one hand, it's a it, on the one hand, it's kind of a scary number. On the other hand, uh, I mean, what do you know about the transmission and the pathology, if any, of this virus in bats? And why, if it's that common, isn't it even more common? Yeah, uh, like, I agree with that last comment because, you know, it, I used to work on the reptile coccidia, yeah. the protozoan parasites of reptiles. You would find 100% prevalence. Yeah. Like, well, you know, it, some, some parasites just continuously cycle through individuals in a population. Um, in, in the old days, when uh, pre, pre-urbanization humans, um, there's a lot of work being done on parasites in humans, we would have had pretty much 100% prevalence. All of us would have been continuously infected with nematodes and helminth parasites. Um, and this is a fecal oral parasite, essentially. It's a virus. Now, if there's no solid immunity in a bat, um, you're going to have a high prevalence. And we now know a lot more about that. We've sampled now over 16,000 bats in China um, or taken sam- over 16,000 samples. Um, that's a huge number. And from that, you c- we, get, we regularly get prevalence, PCR prevalence of 5 to 10%, which is really high. I mean, um, like I said, the West Novaris, we, we did a lot of work in West Novaris in the US um, and found um, you have to really target hatch year birds, birds that have just been hatched out of the egg that year that get bitten and infected with West Nile to find West Nile. The adults have already been infected and they're all immune um, or they're dead. Um, so for bats to get 30% PCR, pre- uh, 30% sera prevalence, we now know from humans and COVID-19, that's probably not herd immunity. Right. Um, we also don't know if those bats are immune. It may be that this is just a a virus that that can reinfect um, adult bats, or it may be that there's just um, so many bats in a in a colony that it creates the density needed to keep that virus endemically circulating. Is it possible that the uh, the sero prevalence is not really an accurate measure of the immune status of the population? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and by the way. We're beginning to see some inklings of that with COVID-19 in right. people too. Um, you know, it, it may be that these don't create a solid immunity. Um, or maybe maybe, maybe cellular immunity is uh, right. the key, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, vaccine development is going to rely on, they're going to be targeting epitopes that really, um, really drive immunity mm. for COVID-19. So you said that in the bats, this is uh, probably fecal oral. And I assume, yeah. am I correct in assuming that there's probably no significant pathology in the bats? Well, I, I was, I'm always a little bit careful about that now because I come from the wildlife side. And, you know, I, I know from, it's really hard to, you know, to understand pathology in an animal. And to and to then say that the animal wasn't ill, you know. So so we the reason why we we always call um, we call them clinical signs in in animals and symptoms in humans. It comes from the Greek. Symptom means we can talk, we can tell you what how we feel. The animal can't, so we have to look for signs of illness. So if you look at some nice work that was done out of um, a CDC group working on um, Marburg virus in fruit bats, um, and generally. They did infection experiments individually with Marburg into bats. And what they found is you do get an a elevated temperature for, for a brief period. That's a fever. So that's an illness. You do get um, a little bit of weight loss. So weight loss is significant. If we, go, if we get sick and we lose a few pounds, we think we've been pretty badly sick. So I think bats do actually get ill. Okay. I think that it's too simple to say they don't get ill from these viruses. They get right. a very mild infection. I think like we do from herpes, you know, we get a cold sore. And when we catch a common cold, we get we get slightly ill. 
But you don't think it's fatal in bats, right? I don't think so. I mean, there's no evidence. But again, we, no one's done the experiments yet. And yeah. um, I think for for an animal to for a population to carry five to ten ten percent um, actual viral prevalence, um, it would be hard if that was also a fatal disease. Mm. Um, it doesn't seem. I have to point out that Rich is from Austin, and we went a ah. couple. We went a couple of years to see the bats come out of the bridge one night. You you must have seen that at some point in your life, right? Yeah, you know, sadly, I visited Bat Conservation International based in Austin once, and the flight times of my trip meant that I never saw the fire, <laughs> which is ridiculous, but it's famous. So good on you, Richard, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, I spent 25 years at the University of Florida in Gainesville as well, and they have uh, a, a really impressive bat colony there. Uh, yeah, that they've, been, they've housed, uh, uh, built houses for them, and... <laughs> Uh, you know, so it's a pretty common activity to go out and watch the bats uh, fly out at night, watch all these bats fly over you. It's right. an amazing thing. We do it in Malaysia and Gomantong Caves where you've got, you know, a million bats flying out and wow. half a million cave swiftlets flying in at the same time. You've got hawks that speci specifically um, feed on bats, diving on them, catching them. You've got pythons mm -hmm. grabbing them as they go. And just uh, <laughs> amazing to watch. Wow. So there, these caves that you go to in uh, China, there, how many bats are in there? Well, I mean, it depends. So, some caves are very um, have very small colonies now, and you know, one yeah. of the problems we've seen is a lot of caves are being developed, or so they're close to human habitation. They're disturbed, and it's uh, you know, there are very small numbers of bats. But in, in a good cave, you'll you'll get a few a few um, thousand bats, and in really good caves, you'll get tens of thousands, uh, maybe higher. Okay, so the the reason I asked about PCR is for, for this first study, you didn't recover any infectious viruses from these bats, right? That's right. We didn't, I don't think we cultured virus at yeah. that point. Yeah, that came later. Yeah. So there's a second paper, which I think is the next one, but I could be wrong. It's a 2013 nature paper, isolation and characterization of a bat SARS like coronavirus that uses the ACE2 receptor. You remember that one? Yeah, I do. And yeah, and the, the point of, of this is okay. We found these bat, these viruses that are related to SARS phylogenetically. So I think I think in the first paper, the closest was ninety eight percent genome identity to SARS, and we thought we'd found the reservoir of SARS. But it was only a while later that you know Linfa analyzed the sequence and said, well, actually, you know, it doesn't look like it could bind to um, ACE two. So it's as far as we know, it's unlikely that these mm -hmm. viruses could infect people so we've not really found the progenitor the the origin of SARS-1 um, what we found with the further work we did with WRV1 and SHCO14 I get, I'll always get these virus names confused is um, found viruses that really do look like they could have led to SARS you know then they, they can bind to human cells it was a critical finding and that's why it was uh, high impact at the time I think that in that paper, you recovered one, at least one infectious isolate, right? Yeah, I think it was SHCO14, but I, I right. might be wrong. All right. Now, is that a particular challenge? Well, I didn't do that work. That's what, what Jung Lee was doing. And yeah, I mean, growing viruses, from what I know about it, is really hard to do. Um, you know, people who do it uh, become very well known in the virological community. <laughs> Um, because they, you know, it's super useful to have an isolate of a virus because then you can do infection experiments. You can find out what whether these viruses can infect civets or pigs, for instance. And, you know, big questions like that. I mean, if we've got viruses out there that can infect people, can infect livestock, um, that's a real risk for future emergence. So it's super important, and it isn't easy to do from what I know. Was this a separate sampling then that led to this? 2013 paper yeah, another, think, another trip yeah by then we were we were up and running doing repeated field work in china we had a field team um we were doing more work with Zhang Li at the time mm. um and really honing in because we had funding to go out and do that work from nih and um the idea was to say if the wildlife markets are where sars emerged and bats are the origin how did it get into the market system where in china were the bats picked up from I and mean, you can't go back in time and look at it mm. but what you can do is trace back with um, the sequences the genetic sequence of the, of the viruses 
with what you find about the wildlife trade. So we were also doing a huge amount of work on the wildlife trade. And what we found was by then it had changed. The big markets, didn't you didn't really see many bats in them. Um, but we did know that people were hunting and eating bats. They were selling them directly to restaurants. Mm. So it was a more localized um, issue. And, you know, we, we, th we thought the um, risk had shifted to the rural parts of China. Is, is, uh, is it correct that the markets were temporarily closed after SARS-1, right? Yeah, it was very, I mean, it's interesting. They, they closed the big markets, the ones where SARS originally, mm. the first few patients came from. Uh, Guangdong, um, uh, Guangzhou, actually, the city Guangzhou. And then um, they opened them again a few months later. They closed them again during the year of the Olympics. As a sort of, hmm. we think it was because a lot of tourists were going to be in China and they didn't want this sort of Western outrage at these wet markets. They're pretty difficult places to visit if you're, um, if you're not used to it. When your first time you go, it is a shocking sight to see all these animals Basically, they're treated pretty cruelly. They're, they're kept in very small cages for long periods of time. They're clearly not in good shape, and it's um, and they're killed in front of you quite often. It's it's pretty hard to. Mm. So this including companion animals, dogs and cats. Uh -huh. So this particular paper was important because it was the first time that you showed that you could get a virus from a bat that would bind ACE two. So that clearly had pandemic potential, right? Yeah. Now did. I mean, what is the closest virus to SARS-1 that has been found in bats? What's the percent identity? Do you recall? I think, I don't recall, but I think at this point we've got a bunch that are, you know, 99% whole genome identity. Okay. But there's one, one particular um, paper that we published that shows that if you look at individual genes from SARS-1, mm -hmm. we have within the, the viral community in one cave, just about every individual gene of SARS-1 right. basically still there in the, in the viruses, um, pr pretty much um, homologous. Uh, yeah, that's remarkable. So basically yeah. all, all the parts, and they just had to recombine to give you and SARS. They do, they do recombine quite a lot, these coronaviruses. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I mean, who knows? Some of these other viruses might be more lethal. Mm -hmm. SARS-1 was 10% mortality rate, case fatality rate. Um we, we were concerned that that was going to emerge again. That was the big issue. But maybe there are others out there that, that still could emerge that, that may be more lethal or more able to transmit. It seems to be a balance between lethality and transmissibility, right? I mean, Yeah, I think that balance, from what we know about it, we don't know much, but from um, – it's lots been done on flu, but if you think about the big picture – Ebola is, is a good example of this. It, Ebola has clear symptoms, at least we think it does, and it, it's high mortality rate. So it's, therefore, the mantra goes, unable to spread out the villages. Mm -hmm. By the time you, you know, you, the, the outbreaks happen, everyone knows because everyone's dying in obvious symptoms. The problem with things like SARS and SARS-2 is they mimic other viruses. You know, a pneumonia um, could be mm -hmm. flu, it could be, um, you know, bacterial or it could be a new coronavirus um and i'm not sure it's a good strategy to rely on that that high mortality doesn't mean it can get out ebola did spread once it got into urban centers in west africa and caused a huge outbreak and then almost spread internationally really the reason it didn't really cause a significant pandemic um international scale beyond west africa was because it's not as transmissible as we thought, you know, it's really contact with Ebola. Whereas COVID nineteen, asymptomatic, presymptomatic, and somewhat airborne. So I uh, check me on this. I'm getting the impression, in a way, that the the uh, ultimately the amount of spread globally could be a function not only of the intrinsic properties of the virus and how it spreads, but also our perception, our behavior in response yeah. to the characteristics of the disease. Exactly. And, you know, there's this absolute myth around viruses that each virus has an R0 that's intrinsic to that virus. Measles, we all know, is 10 to 16. Huge. It can spread very easily, aerosol. Ebola is whatever it is. A flu is, you know... It's, it's simply not true. And, and a lot of modelers, now what you'll hear is you'll, you'll hear them talk about R, 
or RT. R0, R0 is at the beginning of the outbreak, can, and, it, and it assumes that there's no control. Mm. Humans respond. We're very good at responding. When we see something going on, we naturally step back and go the other way. Um, we, we social distance. We avoid things. So the ability of a pathogen to invade a population is shifting all through an outbreak and depends on how we control it. Um, and we can let our guards down, and even pretty lethal viruses could spread quite easily if we're not careful. So th there is a uh, another paper a few years later in PLOS Pathogens, uh, which is discovery of a rich gene pool of SARS-related coronas provides new insights into the origin of SARS. And yeah, this is I a, remember that one very well. This yeah. is, uh, I think, in ver I, I always look at this because there are a lot of new viruses here. So is this, do you keep going back or is it an ongoing surveillance that is, is happening? Yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting because Chung Lee um, is a virologist from the lab side. Yeah. I'm an ecologist from the field side, and I've got I've got a team of people who do risk modeling and try and tell you what to do. Mm. And it's always a push and pull between what we should be doing theoretically to test a hypothesis versus finding great viruses, which is what Jung Lee wants to do. And, you know, we all do. So what, what Jung Lee's team have been doing um, is really focusing on getting us to caves where they've already found stuff and we want to find more. What we're trying to do is to say we also need to test broadly too. So we did a we surveyed across large parts of southern China, mm. um, we and did a huge amount of work. We've also so we tried to strategically survey to find more SARS one type viruses. In our current version of what the grant that's just been terminated, we were very strategically targeting what's missing. Because if you focus too much down one line, you may be missing something really important over here. And we actually had a hypothesis that maybe viruses that are similar to SARS-1, but, you know, 30% different, they may be able to infect human cells and, and cause pandemics. But then if we've got vaccines and drugs, they may evade those um, vaccines and drugs. So we were, we were specifically going to target the more diverse mm -hmm. groups. And that's, that work still needs to be done. Yeah, I think this speaks to uh, a question that I had because there's a lot of focus on the existence of SARS-like coronaviruses in the bats, but yeah. isn't it just as possible that there are other coronaviruses not in that same group that could spill over into humans that are um, just potentially just as much of a problem? Yeah, maybe even more, Richard, because, you know, we've got in, in the paper we just published um, describing 780 sequences of bat coronaviruses. Um, the, the beta coronaviruses, that's the SARS group, definitely can do a lot of cross-species transmissions, but the alphas seem to have an even worse propensity to do that, and it may be that some of those are more dangerous. We also, when we did some serological work in people in southern China, and we just did a preliminary survey, and again, we then... In the current iteration of that work, we were going to expand that over a much bigger area. Um, we found, surprisingly, I think it was HKU10 um, antibodies against that group of viruses in people. Small number, but that was unexpected. So there are going to be other coronaviruses out there that not only are able to infect people, but already are, and we're missing them. And I think this is the big lesson from all this work is that – the interface for viruses spilling over is not one person that eats a bat. That's the sort of our human way of looking at it. What actually is going on is, look at it from the virus point of view. Tens of millions of, of bats fly out every night in Southeast Asia over people's houses. Um, people are going in those caves. They're digging the guano out and spreading it on their crops. They're sheltering in the caves from the rain. They live nearby the caves. So you've got hundreds of millions of people. And this, these viruses are trickling across the interface daily, every day. We, we estimate if you take the 3% prevalence we got in Yunnan against um, bat coronaviruses, seroprevalence in a small survey of people, and you look at the rural population where the bats, the rhinolophus bats live in Southeast Asia, if it's 3% across that range and you take account of a two- to three-year survival of those antibodies in people, 
you're talking about one to seven million people infected every year. That's huge. Um, and it makes sense because we know that pandemics are a small fraction of the whole spillover that goes on in the background. So uh, uh, that, that serology paper was uh, really fascinating to me. Among other things, I was interested in some of the people who were seropositive, what their travel history was. And you yeah. have individuals who are seropositive who have spent their whole lives in the village uh, or traveled no more than a few kilometers outside the village. Now, can you speak to what their exposure might have been? Do they engage in the sorts of activities like collecting guano and et cetera that would give them an intimate exposure with the virus? Well, I mean, the, the real frustrating thing about that serology work is right now it's the only thing that's been done in, in rural communities on exposure to the viruses we're all worried about, the coronaviruses from bats. And with COVID now, that kind of muddies the water a bit for those future studies. We're going to have to be very careful to remove all the people who had COVID-19. Mm. Um, but I think we can say people in rural areas who have nothing to do with the wildlife trade are getting exposed to right. bat coronaviruses. So that's a real important point. Um, if, if the Chinese government is going to ban the wildlife trade, then we all feel great. We're all safe now. We're not going to get the next COVID-19. Not true. Right. Um, we've got one to seven million people in rural Southeast Asia who are getting exposed all the time. Mm. Um, the, the things that people are doing out there are incredible. We've published a couple of social science papers um, that do interviews with people, focus groups, and they talk about what they do. They eat wildlife for medicinal purposes. They, um, they have this incredibly deep exposure. They dig bat feces and put it on their food crops. And they, they have pig farms or wildlife farms where bats are flying in and out every night. I mean, we've seen the evidence of that. We've also got a, a, an alpha coronavirus um, that kills pigs that seems also able to potentially infect people. So there's just this incredible risky exposure by living in rural Southeast Asia. Uh, so and what, well, I'm sorry, sorry Brian. Deal, dealing with that is, is going to be hard. I mean, that will involve understanding what all these myriad pathways are that people get exposed and working with them to reduce that risk. That takes a lot of time. Have you been able to look at any of the samples to determine if there are other virus types besides coronaviruses? Well, not yet. Uh, I'm not right now. I'm not able to look at any of the samples to do anything as, as a, because the, the grant's been uh, terminated. Um, so, look, I, those samples are still there. We have sixteen thousand samples in, in the freezers in Wuhan. Um, a bat. We have samples from people, and we have plans to do a lot more work. It needs to be done, and it's not just our group needs to do it. We all need to be doing this all around the world. Sitting here in this lockdown surely makes us realize we do not have a strategy for the next unknown pandemic. Our strategy right now is sit here, crash our own economies on purpose, and wait for a vaccine. That's not a strategy. That's just, um, you know, that's just not good. And there is there are things we can do. We can be out there finding these viruses getting the sequences, even from a sequence, you can test drugs against them, vaccines against them. Um, we don't need to be um, culturing every single sample, which is expensive and difficult and dangerous. We can do a lot with, um, with, a, with a targeted strategic approach to get ahead of pandemics. I, I have a whole lot of undergrads here who would love to help analyze those sequences. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Before we leave the seropositivity survey, serological survey, I just wanted to point out that I found it fascinating of the six positive ones, all of them had seen bats flying in their villages, hmm. but none of them recalled any clinical symptoms. And there was no detection, of course, of viral yeah. RNA in their oral or fecal samples. Yes. And again, super frustrating because our, our, our renewal of that NIH grant that did that, funded that work specifically was to, to test the hypothesis that exposure to bat coronaviruses is linked to clinical, to symptoms in people. Uh, and to, to do a different type of survey where you do, you follow the same patients. We were going to do clinical work with rural 
remote clinics where people come in with mm. um, severe acute respiratory disease and we test them for antibodies and PCR for bat viruses. Um, that work needs to be done. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sure um, that people are getting sick from bat coronaviruses, not just uh, SARS-related, but other viruses in rural Southeast Asia on a regular basis. And the reason why I say that is if you look back to Nipah, when Nipah emerged in Malaysia, it was a new virus. I mean, it came through pigs to people from bats. Um, we heard these rumors about outbreaks in India. We went to India. We found Nipah virus in bats in India. Um, and then we found that if you look through ProMed, there are just an incredible, um, we published this, this incredible diversity of outbreaks of encephalitis, which is what Nipah causes in humans over the years. And I was shocked at how big these outbreaks were, 70, 80 people dying in a village. Um, in the end, we find that Nipah spills over every year in Bangladesh with a case fatality rate of 70%. And um, these things are out there, they're causing death, and we're missing it. In fact, so you what's, your, what's your perspective now on whether or not there is uh, or was an intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, I mean... I. I've always, I've had sort of mixed, um, mixed view of the intermediate host thing. I mean, I, I would regularly say at conferences, I don't think we needed civets mm -hmm. for SARS-1 to emerge because we, we've now found viruses like WIV-1 and SHC-014 that can infect human cells directly. Um, so you don't need evolution in a separate host. And it's become a bit of a mantra that an intermediate host is needed. Now, um, but, you know, I'm not the world's foremost authority on genomics of viruses. And when I hear people like Eddie Holmes say, look, this, this furin um, cleavage insertion point here in the spike protein is something you would see in an intermediate host. So that's further evidence. And the fact that those pangolin viruses, clearly something's going on. Um, I, I think that it's quite likely that there was. And bottom line, if you've got an intermediate host that's a farmed animal, it massively increases the um, exposure to people. And that's what we saw with Nipah, with Hendra, um, and seemingly with SARS-1, and it may well have been part of COVID-19. It's going to be really interesting to see what we find on that. I, I will, you know, we're definitely going to go out and look for that idea. But the um, this, there hasn't been outside of bats much surveillance at all, right? The pangolin was well, the only other, correct? Yeah, we looked. We looked in bamboo rats. So we started this work. We were, we've been working with wildlife farmers. One of, one of the things we looked at was the trade, and what we found is the trade shifted a bit over the years. And instead of this, what, what our Western minds envisaged, which was hundreds of hunters selling animals that were then shipped over to the big markets in Guangzhou, um, that wasn't what was happening. What was happening is people are buying animals, uh, catching animals locally, selling them to restaurants. People are catching animals, breeding them in farms, selling them to the trade, trucking them across China, selling them to restaurants. You order them on, on your phone now with WeChat. Um, you know, you, you tap in what you want and it arrives at the restaurant and you go there for your meal. So there's this huge diversity. And in the, the wildlife farms in particular are very interesting. You've got um, a mixed array and sort of menagerie of mammals um, not pangolins because they're so rare and they don't breed in captivity very well. But bamboo rats, you know, you'll have a farm with 3,000 bamboo rats, 100 civets, 50 porcupines, pigs, um, you know, uh, ducks, chickens, frogs, and snakes. You'll have a farm that specializes in aquatic animals, frogs, snakes, and koi poos, these giant, giant um, herbivorous sort of water rats. There's this incredible uh, entrepreneurial thing going on in China, and it was promoted by the government as a poverty alleviation measure to bring people out of poverty in rural areas. So we, we worked with them, and we tested a lot of bamboo rats and didn't find any coronaviruses. Um, we've also been testing pangolins um, at the beginning of the wildlife trade chain and not found any coronaviruses in them. Seizures before they go to China. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely going to be some interest in working it, but you're right, they've been undersampled, but not completely mm. um, unsampled. So this uh, PLOS pathogens papers that we've mentioned, this, this sampling was done in a cave in Yunnan, right? 
Is that correct? Is that yeah. is that a separate cave from the first studies that we've talked about today? I think so. But you know, it's um we've been to now dozens of caves, probably, mm-hmm. you know, over a hundred caves. And uh if you look at uh, maps of caves in South China, there are hundreds and hundreds mm-hmm. of these. It's a big limestone cast landscape with uh, incredible diversity and some some well known back caves. And I think in your your most recent preprint, which just came out yesterday, I think uh, you mentioned that the uh, the neighboring countries have not been sampled at all. Like, and yeah. and they are likely to have SARS like coronaviruses there as well. Correct? Yeah, because what you're going to look at, um, you're going to look at this from the bat and the and the virus, and, and it's a biogeographical thing. So we've got this human border on, on South China, but mm. Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam has exactly the same species of bats. It, it probably has exactly the same viruses and some others. Um, it probably has um, a, a, a range of other mammals that are found in China too. And it's really been undersampled. And we know that in those countries, there's a very active wildlife trade over to China. China is like a sponge bringing animals in from around the world for the big markets and for this incredible demand for food and and other other uh, you know medicine. Yeah. Um, so we know that if you go to southern Yunnan, Rui Li, the border crossing to Myanmar, people are going over there to buy jade, um, go for the weekend, and they'll eat wildlife in Myanmar because it's more open and easier to get. And people are bringing animals across. So it's quite possible that these virus trickle across those um, borders too mm-hmm. and get into the big cities in China. So is sounds there like research like this. Sorry. Go I'm ahead, just going to say, it sounds like there's a lot of this research to be done. Oh, yeah, huge. Yeah, I was wondering if there's this kind of research going on in those neighboring countries. Um, I think some groups have done little bits. Um, and, I mean, you know, it, I think that it, it needs to be done in an incredibly – you know, order of magnitude, more intense way. If you think about what we did when we first looked at SARS-1, we sampled a few hundred bats and found viruses 98% similar to SARS that couldn't infect human cells. It's taken us 10, 15 years to get a few hundred, uh, you know, probably we'll end up probably with over a thousand uh, distinct, you know, viral groups there. Um but we estimate, if you believe the, the numbers in the Global Virum Project analysis, and admittedly, they're back of the envelope, but we estimate you're looking at ten to 15,000 coronaviruses, distinct what you would call viral species, in um, bats globally, and probably a few thousand in that region um, are, are coronaviruses. And it, it is EcoHealth Alliance the main organizer of this kind of sampling or are there others as well um there's plenty of other groups doing this work there need to be plenty more More. we need 10 times what we do and we need to now not just focus on southeast asia i mean we've been doing some work in in south america Mm -hmm. brazil mexico uh, north america and and, um and and further south bolivia and peru that that show up interesting viral groups if if you think about biogeography um it's probably pure um, serendipity that the bats in Southeast Asia, rhino office bats, co-evolved with, with SARS-related coronaviruses, and they happen to carry this pretty nasty group. Um, we know that teropus bats somehow co-evolved with paramyxoviruses that turned out to be quite nasty. What have Latin American bats got in them that could be quite mm-hmm. lethal to people that haven't yet emerged? There's a huge amount of work to be done. The biggest diversity of bats on the planet is in the Amazon, is in Latin America. Mm. Um, And it's just hardly scratched at yet. I think there's going to be huge, interesting work to be done. So speaking of geography, how about MERS? Yeah. Uh, 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 Is there, what's the status of the evidence of a bat origin for MERS? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that it's originally a bat clade from which MERS emerged, you know, and um, the question is, is it how recent and how likely is it to happen a new a new strain to get into people? Um, so the, the the evidence for that is the phylogeny of MERS related viruses it is bats, basically. You know, that that's where we find the, the closest relatives to MERS, and and there are plenty of them. You know, there's a hedgehog virus that's similar, etc. But 
it looks like bats are the likely origin. Um, and we did find that one annoyingly tantalizing, possibly erroneous um, sequence in Saudi Arabia. We published it in EID. Ian Lipkin was kind of the uh, head of the group that went out there. And he was reluctant to publish that because it was one animal and it was identical. It was a fragment of sequence identical to human uh, MERS. So we weren't sure. It was in a tomb bat. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that most people who work in the field believe that bats are the origin of MERS. It's just been in camels a long time, so it's pretty much endemic in camels now. Okay. And then we, we actually did an analysis of if you look at camel production, and we've got data from FAO on this, and bat biodiversity of the type that are known to carry MERS-related coronaviruses, where would it have originated? And surprisingly, what our analysis showed, we've not published this, it's kind of, it was just a small study. Our analysis shows that the Horn of Africa, Sudan, Ethiopia, is where these this clade would have started. Mm -hmm. and that's a big production site for shipping camels out of. Um, it's not a good place to be doing work. It includes Somali, which is not easy to do field work in. South Sudan, places like that. I wanted to ask you about this um, this bad isolate RATG thirteen. Did that come from the 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 same sampling that's reported in the PLOS pathogen paper? Because it's not reported in that paper. I'm just wondering. I can't remember, but I, it is reported somewhere because yeah. it's reported as BT BT CoV Bat CoV. Ah. 4997, I think, because you you emailed me about this, and I think yeah. you were right. And um, it's kind of interesting that at the time when these things happen, it's just one of <laughs> thousands of samples and, you know, hundreds of viral positives. And, you know, it's of no interest at all. And then suddenly it becomes a big conspiracy theory over why is it renamed a different name? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, every aspect of this has become – something for people to talk about. It's just absolutely bizarre to me. Um, pretty straightforward. In those days, you called it that. And when the RDRP sequence went up on the web, it was correctly called bt cov 4997 And I think RATG13 is the same. But, of course, by then it's a whole genome sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Generally went back to the sample, got a whole genome. The RDRP may be slightly different. I don't know. It's a consensus sequence. Yeah. Um, but the original, I think it is from that cave, from my memory of the papers, mm. yeah. So that was for a while, the, well, maybe it still is, the highest genome identity with SARS-CoV-2, I believe. I'm uh, proud to say that it still is. Still is. <laughs> yeah. Because there's another virus, RMYNO2, you know that one? Yeah, it's, yeah that's right. And, uh, and it's yeah. an old friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, know RMYNO2 very well because um, you have to you have to spell it right when you write a paper on it, and if you get it wrong, <laughs> really messed up. Then the conspiracists are really going to have a field day. Um, RMY Rhinolophus malayanus, the Malayan fruit bat. Um, RA Rhinolophus affinis, um, a different fruit bat. I can't remember what affinis stands for. Um, YN is Yunnan. Yeah. The uh, RMTG, TG, I think is Tong Gwen or Tong something. Yeah. It's the county that the sample came from. 1 3, RATG 1 3, 1 3 is the year, 02 is the year for the old. So, yeah, RM 2 is um, closer, I think, on the RDRP, but whole genome mm -hmm. slightly less. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I think there's also multi basic uh, amino acid yeah. insertions too. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is the most interesting thing about the virus. And, of course, it, what it tells you is that getting the whole genome is much more interesting than yeah. just getting a short fragment. Um, the fact that there is a natural bat virus with an, with an insertion in that spike protein is really important because that became one of the big conspiracy theories that this furin cleavage insertion point was put in yeah. by um, the lab. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're going to find hundreds more. Um probably there will be a few dozen much closer to yeah. SARS-2. And we'll know eventually where they come from. Yeah. So sampling is ongoing, obviously, right? Well, not ours, no. <laughs> not yours. <laughs> We're not sampling right now. But um, it should be. Um, sampling in China, from what I know, is not happening yet. Um, China is mm. open, but 
travel is not easy within China. You've got to go on in, um, inside China. You've got to still go on lockdowns when you get into a new place. You've no. got to have your, your uh, Weibo um, permit scanned and everything. So it's okay. not straightforward. But we'll, we'll be out there again. We will be doing this work. And um, we're going to carry on sampling. And some groups will find some very interesting viruses that will explain where SARS-2 came from mm-hmm. eventually. You you mentioned earlier the Global Virome Project. Maybe you could explain uh, to us what that is. Well, we we started um, a few years ago. We realized that by sampling the same animal species over and over again, we were getting to we were beginning to find we found a lot of new viruses, but then we were starting to find the same viruses, mm. and we were finding um, it was harder to discover the new ones, which kind of makes sense because some viruses are rare. Um, you may never find them. You may have to sample tens of thousands of animals to find those rare viruses. But the common ones you're going to find quickly, and then it gets harder and harder. So we realized there's a – you know, I, I put this question to Kevin Oliver, who works for us, and said um, I think day one when he first started working for us, he was hired to work on NEPA. And I said to him, yeah, sub-project. I want to know how many unknown viruses there are on the planet. There has to be a way to discover it. And Kevin said, that's ridiculous. And um, but People I like, ask I him that point. question all the time. Yeah. I, I, thought, I made a point of every week I would ask him, all right, very good. I'm glad you've done all this interesting work, but have you found out how many unknown viruses? Now, we hired uh, some ecologists, and they still work for us. Some of them don't. Um, and those guys came up with a, with a strategy, which is, in conservation biology, if you get a patch of forest with rare animals like tigers or pandas, and you want to know how many are there, because you've got to do that to see if you're doing a good job of conservation, um, you're not going to catch all of them. You can't do that. So what you do is you catch, you start sampling, and there's an algorithm for um, the number of sample of, of survey hours or trap nights or traps versus the number of times you find a new animal versus a, a recapture. So you mark and recapture. And, and the mark and recapture algorithm is well known in, in ecology. We applied it to virology, and we predicted the unknown viral diversity for each of X families of viruses, like 7 or 12, depending on the species, for um, a fruit bat from Bangladesh and a macaque species from Bangladesh. Now, we then extrapolated that in a... Back of the envelope calculation that's probably full of assumptions and errors, of course, to every mammal species. And you can come up with a rough estimate of how many unknown viruses there are. We think it's about 1.7 million in the 21, I think, or 24, I can't remember, viral families that can infect people, um, zoonotic families with zoonoses in them. Um, and because we know how much it costs to do the field work that we've been doing, we can also estimate how much it would cost to discover all of those viruses. We, we included water birds for just one viral family, influenzas, and we came up with an estimate of, I think it was 7 or $8 billion for 100% of the unknowns. Mm. But because you find most of them early on, your discovery curve saturates and you get many more early. If you do 71% of them, it's $1.2 billion. It's a real bargain. And, um, I mean, the idea for this first came up, I gave a talk at, um, at a, a government meeting, and the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy Director, was there from the White House, uh, Franca Jones. And I, I kind of uh, faked it a little bit. I said, look, I've got a piece of paper with the number on I did actually... We just calculated it the day before. So I had this piece of paper, and I kind of pulled it out and said, it will only cost, you know, $7 billion. And I saw it right down the number. I thought, wow, this isn't so crazy, but obviously it is a lot of money. Um, we've been trying to get this up and running. We've had huge criticism for the um, various reasons, valid criticism, you know. The numbers are inaccurate, of course. And um, finding viruses doesn't mean you can stop them, of course. Um, but our, our vision in the Global Viral Project is that by understanding what viruses are out there, we get a better handle on what the risk is. Um, we get sequences that can be used to design vaccines and drugs, just like the bat virus coronavirus sequences were used by Mark Dennison 
to test remdesivir against known and pre-pandemic bat viruses, bat viruses that hadn't emerged yet. Um, and, and not only that, you can then hone down, you can kind of triage which are interesting viruses and do more work on them and get out into those communities and reduce risk. So we've, we've formed a 501c3 um, called the Global Viron Project, and we're right now raising money. We're going to go out and do it. Um, many, many other groups are, and we're going to form a, a coalition of national viron projects to get that work done. Peter, I want to bring those numbers into uh, people's heads in terms of what what's relative to what. So I wrote some of this down, where the estimated cost maybe to identify all of these would be $10 billion. And the Human Genome Project, for instance, in today's dollars cost uh, $5 billion. So compared to five or $10 billion, the US military discretionary budget for one year is $686 billion. Or I looked at some estimates for what the costs for the COVID-19 pandemic uh, are going to be. And there's a wide range, but one estimate was that for the first two months, the cost is about $2.1 trillion, or by another estimate, maybe $1.6 trillion per year. Anyway, the you know $10 billion then starts to sound like a drop in the bucket. I mean, even compared to the military budget for one year. And look, Kathy, for you, we'll do it for one point two billion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, sounds good. Right? Yeah, no, you're dead right. But the problem we, we we have with all of this is the minute you compare a budget, it looks like you're trying to take money away from that from that really important work that WHO is doing or that you know the DOD is doing around the world or whatever it is. I think that if you, so, you know, you, we can make witty comments like the human genome cost five billion and all they did was one sample what a ripoff um but <laughs> yeah, that's not fair um what what um, what we're dealing with are critical threats to public health that cause regular outbreaks in many countries around the world um that every now and again cause major pandemics that cost trillions of dollars um we've actually started work on a on a good calculation of return investment but if you do a a simple return on investment and, and estimate that if we can reduce the number of emerging diseases by 5% or the number of people who are infected by new emerging diseases by 5%, you get a nine to one return on investment, which is really good. Um, and I think that's an achievable number by going to these countries and finding another hundred different Ebola viruses our vaccines and drugs developed against them can be tested against those viruses and will therefore be more effective. Our diagnostics will be more effective. We, you know, we know that in, in um, West Africa, there's a background serology of sometimes as high as 10%. So there are other things spilling over. We know that PREDICT discovered this Bombali virus, this new Ebola virus. There are probably many, many more out there. Um, on, on a very most basic level, I don't, I don't know of any other existential threat to our species or our businesses that we don't insure against and at least find out how big it is and where it is. You know, earthquakes, hurricanes, um, terrorism, we map them, we find out where they are. With terrorism, after 9-11, we did incredibly um, deep surveillance. We, we track every single phone call coming into the U.S., that's the equivalent of doing the whole Viron project. Um, and then if we hear of the rumor of um, a terrorist attack, we send in drones, we disrupt the, the, um, the network, disrupt the, 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 um, the cell. For, for pandemics, we don't do any of that. We wait for them to emerge. When they emerge, our response is stay in your own home for three months. Work stops. Your economies are going to crash but at least you're not dead. And we'll have a vaccine sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. Again, that is not a strategy. And for something that's such a fundamental threat to us, albeit a rare event, we can do better as a species. And I think the Global Viron Project has to be one part of that. There's a lot of other stuff we need to do as well. Do you think that this pandemic will motivate people to do this? Or you think after it's over, it's back to business as usual? 
Yeah, it's really tough. I mean, I, I remember Ebola. That should have motivated us. Yeah. But here's how cynical you can become. I mean, we did an analysis of Ebola just before um, the first U.S. case, basically. The guy who came back infected. Um, and it was raging in West Africa. And we do a thing where we track flights and predict where viruses are going to go. And we, we had a list of the top five airports in the U.S. it would come in through. And the, the guy who did the analysis, Pavi Saseni, who works for, your, for State Department now, he said, um, what shall we do with it? You can't publish this, not that interest. I said, well, do a press release and put it out and see who picks it up. So we put out this press release, and the only reporter that picked it up was, uh, we, got a, we got an email from Boston Port Authority saying, take down your website because Boston does not have direct flights from West Africa. And the point about our algorithm is it, it takes into account connections. Um we we hyped up two weeks later a person came into the us 24 7 news so we rapidly get um full 24-hour news coverage of pandemics during the pandemic it really rapidly goes away i think that even after covid19 a year from now two years from now people just won't care that much and um, efforts to do big strategic investment to prevent the next one are going to have to be done now for the next year or two, or we're going to lose momentum. So given everything you've said and the importance of the global virum, why the hell was your money taken away then? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I, mean, I think that the answer to that is um, conspiracy theories around the origin of the virus. I mean, it's pretty clear if you follow the pathway. I'm sorry, guys. I want to just uh, okay. that. One minute. I'm going to go on mute for a second. Yeah. It's Donald. He wants to give your money back. <laughs> he, he's heard all of this and has realized, yes, this is very important. I didn't realize we were live streaming. <laughs> Success, <you're> gonna... no. <laughs> um, no, I, look, uh, you, your question was, I can't remember it. I said, okay. given everything you've said about needing to do surveillance, then the NIH takes away your money to do just that. Why? Right. I think that, that um, there's something very deep. First of all, if you follow the connection, there, was a, there were discussions around the origins and a conspiracy theory about the origins of this virus from very early on in the outbreak. Mm. The one piece of data that, that generated that was that there's a biosecurity lab in Wuhan and it emerged in Wuhan. Um, this is a very old meme in our, in our psyche that labs with barbed wire around them that you're not allowed into people get paranoid about. I mean, we had it in the UK with putting down the, the um, defense lab over there. Um, and if something happens nearby, then oh, it has to have come from there. Mm. You know, so there is no evidence that it escaped from the lab. Um, but every time you try and logically argue, this is a classic conspiracy theory that people just eventually go to the, the, the bottom argument of, how do you know these guys went up to no good in that lab and, and um, were doing things behind your back? And of course, at some point, they rely on your inability to prove a negative. Um, now, that was picked up by the press. Um, it was then promoted by the Daily Mail in the UK, which is a, um, you know, a, a tabloid newspaper that's trying to get people to read it. People love conspiracy theories. It was then picked up by right-wing press here in the US, and the president heard it, and a reporter, a right-wing news reporter, asked President Trump, about a grant to Wuhan Institute of Virology where this virus was allegedly from. He said he's going to end the grant. That grant turns out to be um, Eco Health Alliance's grant, unfortunately. We're the only organization who had federal funding to work with Wuhan. Um, so we were the target. I mean, it's just really unfortunate. Hmm. Now, since that time, there's been significant uh, pushback from there's the I saw in the news a letter from a bunch of Nobel laureates and a bunch of scientific associations addressed to um, the uh, head of HHS and uh, the head of uh, NIH. I have not heard anything since. Do you know what the status of that is? Um, so, you know, the one group you've not heard any pushback from is EcoHealth Alliance. Um, we know what's going on here. Uh, we know that the, there's, a, there's an election coming up. Um, where we've got a president who's on the ropes and is a president who has in the past um, lashed out and is willing to go after 
small non-profit organizations for whatever purpose if it fulfills the political demands i understand that i understand that this is we're a great target for that so we we were not going to the press with this we just responded to nih and said please don't do it um, but they did it we we talked to our program officers and i said to them you know we'll we'll just get on with our work we're not going to make a fuss about it we're not going to go to the press um someone leaked it in, uh, to politico from within nih so we had no choice um I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just delighted that 77 Nobel Prize winners have raised this issue. They're not there defending Eco Health Alliance's funding. That's not the issue. I mean, I'm sure they, they feel very badly that some group got targeted. The bigger issue here is um, for everyone who's funded by NIH, there's that special moment when you get the notice of award, NOA. And it's just this beautiful email now. It used to be a piece of paper that says, you've got your money. You can go out and do the work that is your whole, all your thought and energy has gone into the design of that program. And now you can go out and do it. Yes. It's meaningless. It's just gone. I mean, if if that can be cancelled out on a whim um, by the director of NIH, whose job it is to, like their prime directive as the director of NIH is to preserve the dignity and objectivity of that review process. If that person is willing to cancel your grant out um, without recourse, for convenience, for political purposes, then a notice of award is meaningless. And that's why the the Nobel Prize folks have gone out there and said that. Um, Obviously, we're very upset that we've lost funding for really critical work. We're going to do the work anyway. We're doing it voluntarily right now. the work will carry on. It's our mission to do that work. We, our legal mission is to find the origins of outbreaks and try and prevent them. So we're going to carry on. Um, the bigger issue here is what does it tell us about the U.S. research system that underpins really the, the best biomedical research on the planet? If we can't have some sanctity to NIH's process, then our whole biomedical infrastructure is under threat, and that's a problem. I think that's what you're really seeing with those protests. Hmm. Well, is it possible that other countries can step in because these are viruses that are not specific to the U.S., obviously? Well, ironically, you know, let, let's let's just call the spade a spade. Ironically, if, if the reason for cancelling this grant is because we're in a trade war with China right now, We have 16,000 bat samples in a freezer in China that we collected using U.S. taxpayers' money. I can't work on them, but China can. So how does this benefit us in any way at all? It massively undermines the very logic behind that national security threat um, to take away the last contact, because we are the last contact with the last organization funded by the federal federal, uh, government to work with... um, Wuhan Institute of Virology. If you're worried about that lab, don't remove the last contact to that lab. Um, Absolutely um, the wrong decision. And it was made, I think, for political expedience, as many decisions are by um, governments. But in this case, directly undermining the rationale behind the decision, and pretty obviously too. Well, hopefully after... um we have a change of administration. You can reapply for some NIH support. I don't think you ought to have to reapply. It ought to be just reinstated. <laughs> I agree. Well, look, I mean, let's be clear. I can reapply today to do the same work in China. I mean, that wouldn't be a good use of my time. Clearly, yeah. it's not going to happen. Um, I don't think there's any directive from the federal government that you can't work with China. Um, it's not... Um, it's not in any of the NIH documents. I mean, ironically, we were told that the grant doesn't fit the um, the objectives of NIH at, at present, but two days or the day before we got that letter, um, NIAD put out their, their COVID-19 strategic plan, and our work fit every all four of their key goals. So clearly it's not um, a logical decision going on. But, yeah, we could apply again. We can apply to do similar work elsewhere. Mm. Um it puts the U.S. research behind. Um, it's just unfortunate. Uh, so from this point of view, Vincent, maybe you did this on a previous show that I haven't heard. Uh, 
Have you discussed exactly what Eco Health Alliance is and what its history is? Yeah, and the, on, on the last uh, episode with okay. Peter, which is uh, okay, know, fine. Month we'll or just so. refer to that. I'll go listen to it. Yeah, Peter talked about the the form. It was it existed before Peter did, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even it's even older than I am now. It's um, forty five years old, something like that. I have to say, I was um, sort of angry about this whole story before, and this. Whole conversation has made that even more so because I didn't think about the idea that you might still have samples there to be analyzed that you're unable to work with. Yeah, um, it's so it's really idea. hard. I, I've not really talked much about that because um, I don't want to, um, I, you know, we're in between the pincers of um, two global superpowers who are, for whatever reason, it's what this is one of the issues that's going to be part of an, an election campaign of, of a president who is um, today in really dire straits and, and has an ability to lash out. So, you know, I don't want to create more problems than, than we've already got. Um, but, yeah, it, it is a, a travesty that, that we've got samples there that U.S. taxpayer dollars have gone to spend. Our dollars, our money has been used to spend that. We could now be – we have 781 new sequences on um, uh, publicly released yesterday of back coronaviruses, any one of which could be a next pandemic. We, we will not get the full genomes of those viruses. We will not know which ones um, can infect human cells um, without getting back out there and doing that work. And I don't, I don't see how that helps protect American lives or American national security. It's absolutely anathema to all the conservative values that, that um, our administration should be holding dear. Mm. Well, listeners, speak up. Write to your congressmen, senators, object. This is not really, this is not where really how science should go forward. And, you know, one thing is I'm not writing to my congressperson. I'm not writing to my senator. And none of our Health Alliance staff are, mm. are, are, you know, trying to raise this to another level. We can't. Yeah. We, we're, we're stuck in this position. We've just got to move on. And our goal is to, um, do anything we can to continue this work. And if if keeping quiet and, and getting on with the work is the way we've got to do it, we will do that. But, um, you know, I really do appreciate what other people are doing out there to protest the, the concept of undermining science for political expediency. That's dangerous and shouldn't happen. Anyone else before we wrap up here? No, I'm sufficiently blown away. <laughs> <laughs> I um, use one of the papers from your lab in one of my courses, um, and you've given me a whole lot more ideas to uh, of things to be using in that course. So you'll be heavily featured in my emerging infectious disease course. Well, my pleasure. But you know what? There's so much good stuff out there. I really think that you know, emerging infectious diseases are interesting. The, the, the process of disease emergence is it's not just viruses, it's people and it's social science and it's wildlife and ecology and behavior and landscape change and global change. And that's why I think that this next 50 years is there's going to be so much good science that comes out of this. If we can bring together all these different disciplines to focus on what's going on. And it's kind of interesting. A lot of the conspiracy theorists now are... Um, uh, coders from the financial world who are dabbling in virology. And I really hope they bring their skills to bear um, with real data sets, sequence data sets, and, and collaborate with virologists who understand what it means um, to and can help them understand why it wouldn't have been um, easy or logical to design a virus, but it actually does happen in nature. It's bringing all these skills together where the real good stuff's going to be, and I'm really looking forward to that. All right, before we wrap up, just want to tell everyone that uh, this year, as you know, American Society for Virology meeting has been canceled, but there's been a grassroots effort by virologists with support from ASV program chair Stephanie Karst and admin Andrea Garcia to make virtual workshops. These are abstracts that would have been presented this year at uh, Fort Collins, ASV 2020. They're going to give be given virtually in various sessions June 15th through 19th. And information can be found at asv.org slash virtual dash workshops. You'll have to get access ahead of time. There's no cost and you don't have to be an ASV member. Pretty cool stuff. Thanks, Kathy. 
Right. I'd just like to add that uh, a lot of people have volunteered to organize and host these workshops. And so I think it's going to be really good. We didn't have the bandwidth to do it in the ASV office, but uh, this is a, a good thing going on. So check it out. If you can't remember the URL, it's also a big purple link from the main ASV website, asv.org. The ones I'm involved with look great. Purple, Kathy, that can't be a coincidence. (laughs) No. (laughs) It's just the color scheme from, I think, back from when Vincent set up the uh, Squarespace website. But, yeah. All right, that's twiv623, microbe.tv slash twiv for links to articles we talked about. Send your questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash Contribute our guest today from Eco Health Alliance, Peter Dashak. Thanks again, Peter. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Great talking to you all. Real fun Thank and uh, always insightful. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. And thank you very much, Peter. This has been uh, terrific. Kathy Spindler, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun and really fun to meet Peter. Thank you. Brian Barker's at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. And thank you so much, Peter. I learned a lot. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.